you'll see on the inside of your worship folder down there at the bottom, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 26, you'll see that in those verses it says, in Christ all shall be made alive. The risen Christ brings not the curse of death, but the blessing of life, the resurrection of the body, the resurrection of our bodies. He leads us through the baptismal sea to new life on the other side, conquering our mortal enemies in its depths. In this way, our Lord Jesus wipes away the tears from all faces, for he has swallowed up death forever. Let us therefore be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We stand together and we sing our exordium hymn, hymn number 488. from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today, for the very first time in the Gospels, Mary cries. Now, Mary Magdalene is a wonderful figure. We're not told how she and Jesus first met or how he cast out seven demons from within her. But she has been with him all along the way. That, that magnificent other way that both wise men and wise women, we've been following them and tracing their steps as it were since Christmas. Mary has been with Jesus since Galilee and she's mentioned more than any other woman in the story of Jesus' last hours. Now, can you imagine what she's seen in just this brief period of time. She has witnessed his crucifixion. She was at his burial. And then of course this morning she is present at the tomb. But today is the first time that she cries. Because it really is the final indignity. For her it is the last straw. I mean, it wasn't enough to betray him. It wasn't enough to lie about him, to humiliate him, and then to kill him. Now they have robbed his grave. Someone has stolen his body. And this is the nasty way that the world works at times. As strong as Mary is, today she breaks. Emotion wins and she is reduced to misery and she weeps. Yet, she's completely wrong. Wrong because she lost her way, or better, she lost Jesus' way. She has forgotten how he moved through his short time with her and the disciples, making wrongs right taking back his creation, one day, one person, one sea, one storm, one demon, and one disciple at a time. 
She has forgotten his teaching of him speaking about a joy that lies beyond the cruelty, of his teaching about this other way home ending in another place which is a new Eden. Mary is a victim of her thoughts. She is numbed by human nastiness and imprisoned by the way that she interprets the world. And listen, to be honest, who can blame her? Darkness has a grip on her, on her emotions and on her thoughts. And we know something of this destitution that Mary feels. We at times can be crushed by fear, confusion, uncertainty. It's too much for Mary. She breaks down. She cries. That is until Jesus approaches her asking these questions. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? What do you want? Mary is indignant. She responds very quickly. If you are the one who did this, who carried him away, tell me and I will fix it myself. I will take him with me dead. Mary still clings to how she feels. She still believes what's going on in her head and what she's thinking. And as long as she's wrapped in that, there can only be more darkness and more despair. No way for her to have a resurrected life. So the same Jesus who spoke eight times in creation, so as to order that swirling chaos of a world, the same Jesus who put eight souls in Noah's ark, that same Jesus who hung his bow of promise in the clouds. Get that, I'm always amazed by that. The bow is extended up and away as opposed to down and at creation. That same Jesus who hung that bow in the clouds, the same Jesus who circumcised little baby boys on the eighth day, making them sons of the covenant, the same Jesus who today on the eighth day rises from the dead, comes to Mary as pure gospel, as pure forgiveness, as pure joy, pure hope, pure love, as the cure itself. Jesus simply says, Mary. And when Jesus names her, Jesus reawakens every good thing inside of her, restoring her to humanity, untwisting her emotions and unbending her thoughts. Suddenly there's a sign of life. His voice draws her eyes up and out, away from herself tugging her emotions and thoughts away from darkness, moving them to light. The living voice of God in flesh dries her tears and her misery at that point dissolves. What Mary desperately needs, Jesus provides. He does it for Mary. Beloved, He does it for you. You come again this Easter all spit and polished. But underneath many of you, you are broken. You are miserable. You are fearful. You are confused. You too are blinded by your emotions and by your thoughts. You're dead, really. Walking dead. But this story is your story. It is a gift. And just like Mary, Jesus calls your name this morning, calling your name in baptism. Ah, get that, an eight-sided baptism. Enlivening you to live an eight-sided life. And like Mary, He speaks a word to you that purifies you in absolution, ordering your chaos and recreating your world, lifting your chin away from yourself, you see, and restores you. Heart and mind, emotion and thought. 
Like Mary, he joins his flesh to yours here in the Eucharist, loving you the way that you need to be loved, for he knows you better than you know yourself. And like Mary, if we could only reply with the simple words, Teacher. And from Jesus learn once more how to love each other, how to hope, how to forgive each other, and how to show mercy towards each other. He is the teacher who can do just that for us. Beloved sorrow and yearning, brokenness and worry, guilt and loneliness, shame and loss, pain and fear, even death itself need no longer to terrify you. You know why? Because it's Easter. And Easter changes everything. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand together.